Welcome everyone. And this is a uh, IEEE SEC Dev 2020 tutorial on principles and uh, practices of cryptographic coding in Java. Um, so this is a joint uh, tutorial given by uh, my PhD students, uh, Ya, Miles, Sharman, and uh, uh, Professor Sadadar Rahman from University of Arizona. And I, I'd like to acknowledge NSF funding, uh, as well as uh, um, ONR Office of Naval Research for supporting our project. Uh, our collaborators also include uh, uh, Bart Miller from UW Madison, Namon from Virginia Tech, and Christina C. Fuentes at uh, Oracle Lab Australia. Software is everywhere and this is something that we're so familiar with, but I just want to emphasize a little bit more recently uh, a newer model of Ford pickup truck F-150 has a hundred million lines of code. And part of the reason is because it has many sensors, electronic control unit, each uh, of those devices has uh, code. And, and so it's really add up. In comparison, some of the more um, uh, important devices, um, Aviation devices, Boeing 787, F-22 Raptors have way fewer lines of code in, in um, aviation industry. It's a longer, uh, industry has a longer tradition of um, uh, regulation on code writing verification and uh, vehicle smart cars is just an uh, does not have uh, that much regulation. And so you, you, know, you just wonder how many vulnerabilities are there. Similarly, if you look at this is a 2017 data from um, an international group that look at a lot of the industry control systems, um, vulnerabilities reported in, in many of them, um, you know, cross-site request forgery, cross-site scripting, are just like ordinary vulnerabilities on workstations, uh, on uh, web servers. Um, and so this, this type of a software vulnerability is permeating through all parts of our life. Um, in 2016, um, this is a day right before Black Friday, you know, the, the Thanksgiving, uh, day of San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agent was hacked um, and, and subject to a ransomware attack. The hackers demand 100 bitcoins, which at that time is almost a million dollars. Right now, this is a September the 1st. I checked uh, one bitcoin is about $12,000. And, um, and, and so the, you cannot get a ticket and so San Francisco um, um, transportation agency decided to have a free subway rides on the on the on the Black Friday this shopping day and so interestingly um, they didn't have to pay because it turns out that all the devices got hacked were dumb terminals it didn't didn't store any sensitive information all the data centers are, are um, kept intact um, but. A lot of people are not that lucky. Uh, this is a statistic that shows that only half of the people who paid, only half of the people who paid the ransom get their data back. But 19.6% of them lost their data. Um, and, and luckily a lot of people who have backups and, and um, preparation ahead of time so they didn't have to pay the uh, ransom. Um, the, the software vulnerabilities are just getting closer and closer to your body, um, you know, wearable devices, medical devices, and, and they will have, if, if, if compromised, if having vulnerability issues, so will have a much bigger impact on people's health. Um, and so, so it's, it's needless to, to say those, those issues are important. Um, and, and for years and years, the, um, the developer has been going through 
um, you know, principles, lessons, trainings to, to educate developers what to do, the secure coding strategies. And we also need tools. We need tools to support them. And we need both education and, and the writing tools. And, and the community need to support developers. Um, but the tools, how good are the tools? And how well are the tools designed for deployment? And those are something that our group has been studying for a while. And, and, and through this tutorial, we hope to deliver the message that it, it's important. The community also need to, need to do more. Um, and this is the Microsoft, very well-known Microsoft Secure Development Lifecycle. And, and so this is sort of um, a guideline for developing uh, uh, the de de development time and design time, um, secure code writing, and involving a lot of uh, tool verification uh, back and forth. And so uh, developers definitely need tools, and, and then there are tools. And, but then however, we still see vulnerabilities, um, and, and sometimes uh, people blame on developers, but who would not want to write secure code? Um, time, budget, resource, lack of resources, and sometimes the tools generate too many false positives. And, and those are all issues that make it harder and harder, and, and then it just build up um, so that some developers just give up. They, they search Stack Overflow to find the, the quick and dirty fix. Um, and so the more I look at this problem, the more I see the gap between um, secure security theory, and you can say it's a cryptographic theory, you know, program analysis theory, um, to, to deployment. And so there is a big gap um, on many of the issues, for example, cross-site request of forgery. This is very well known. Uh, 2008, there was a highly cited paper that reported this uh, vulnerability uh, on, for web browsers. Um, highly cited, but until now, uh, how well is this solved, right? So it, are we eliminate, eliminating, like 12 years of age, are we eliminating all CSRF vulnerabilities? Um, so just a very quickly, what is CFRF? Um, the problem is where the browser um, may automatically attach a victim, a user's credential to send to a server um, um, on a request that's not intended by the victim. And so the, the victim may be tricked into clicking uh, a, a link, a button, visiting a website and end up triggering a submission of form. And that form could be used for password changing, you know, bank fund transfer, and, and then the browser didn't know that this is a, a malicious request and, and end up automatically attach the credential. Um, so this is also called confused deputy problem. It's one type of confused deputy problem. Um, and however, people need help, a developer need help. And this is a real quote from Stack Overflow. Um, Spring Security Java Spring Framework actually has the uh, support for CSRF um, uh, prevention, and then a lot of people don't know how to use it and end up disabling it. Um, and people say, I have no idea why it was enabled by default. And, and so sometimes it's, it's hard because if you graduate school before CSRF vulnerability was uh, discovered and, and then you never sort of got an official chance to, to learn about this. Um, and the, uh, here in the, in the 2018 study with my colleague Namon at Virginia Tech, we look at a lot of the stack, uh, stack Overflow post, and, and here are some quotes. Um, and what, what I really like is this one, I want my client to accept any certificate because I'm the only server that they are going to point to. Um, and, and, you know, I, I suspect this is the app writer, app developer, and, and so they were like, okay, if I write the app so that when it's fired up, it would directly contact to my server. Conceptually, it makes sense, 
um, you know, the statement makes sense, but however, there are so many complications. What if the app get hacked? You know, uh, what if this, the, you know, get intercepted, the traffic get intercepted? You, you will have to verify certificate, right? Um, and so, so we look at that, in that same study, we look at uh, 17, problematic posts on Stack Overflow. And we find out they are extremely influential, and you can call it influencers, uh, social influencers. They were viewed, by that time, as of August 2017, viewed um, 600,000 times. And so extremely uh, influential on um, those vulnerabilities and teaching people to do, you know, um, trust all certificates and so on. And then we interestingly we also find some sort of cyber bullying going on on Stack Overflow. This is actually real quotes. Um, someone, some new user has no reputation and this is sort of the, the reputation score on, on um, Stack Overflow based on how many answers you respond to and how many accepted answers and so on. Um, and, and this, uh, this person got scolded by a more experienced uh, um, user is um, just say, oh, you know, you, you, know, you, 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 you don't know much because you haven't answered, you, you haven't really answered any, anything. But, but this uh, uh, junior people actually encourage people to write more secure code. Um, you know, paparazzi doesn't help. Uh, after our paper published, uh, there is an article uh, reporting our work, but then, you know, it's put words in our mouths and, and we, never said, we never said lazy developers and it's really not developers' fault. Uh, the problem is just uh, complicated. Um, and so, so part of uh, this tutorial, we want to talk about the, the problems, you know, the, the crypto API, the TLS, and then, um, and then leads to some of the tools that the developer may consider using. Um, and this is the, uh, uh, you know, we, are, we have worked on CryptoGuard for a long time. Senator, who uh, recently joined the University of Arizona, came from our group. Um, he's the lead designer of uh, uh, CryptoGuard. And then the work was also, our approach was also uh, adopted by Oracle Labs um, to screen their internal production code. Um, and so one of our um, main effort was spent on reducing false positives, uh, you know, increased position. We also put together a benchmark and, and did a lot of work. Um, and there's a very easy to read article explaining CryptoGuard and then the, the context behind it. And, um, so, in a little bit of an overview of what's coming up today, um, we want to do a, a couple of uh, coding exercise. And I know it's extremely sort of frustrating to read code. And so we make it, hopefully make it easier and uh, for you. Um, but then, but then, you know, you don't have to memorize the code, obviously. Um, but I, I, we just want to point out the issues. The, the issue may show when you write crypto code using crypto APIs in Java, and when you use TLS, uh, you know, write TLS code. And, and uh, we, we hope that you remember the, some of the strategies. Um, and we want to give an introduction to our tool. Um, and, and of course, this is um, developing. We're still um, working on it to make it better, to improve it. Um, we are very proud that we put together a benchmark, um, which hopefully will drive the field to improve all of us to, um, to continue working, improve the accuracy, performance, and so on. Um, the take home message, I, I think I, I really hope at the end of the tutorial that you remember that there are actually tools, uh, um, strategies, and, and a lot of resources to help developers to, to write secure code. Um, developers are not alone and, and also, you know, they need help and we hear their, their, their um, cries and, and for help. And then so, so the community, I think, is also working very hard um, to, to, 
e en enable um, developers and, and everyone to write better code. So that's, that's the introduction, and then this is a summary of uh, some of the references. Um, and uh, um, and the next one uh, coming up is uh, um, Charmin Afros, uh, who is a third year PhD student in my group. Um, and she's gonna go through some um, exercise uh, um, to see whether you can tell secure car, par, uh, code uh, from uh, insecure code. Okay, so I'm uh, going to show very simple uh, secure versus insecure code examples. So I will start with very easy first and then it will go like uh, two or three lines of course you will see uh, in uh, this part. So let's see for um, code examples for URL. So in these two code snippets, you can see that uh, there is two URLs here. So one URL start with HTTP and another URL start with HTTPS. So which one do uh, you think uh, secure or insecure? So I think you already guessed that HTTP is insecure because HTTP uh, lacks encryption, but the secure part HTTPS is actually HTTP with encryption. So the user's data will be uh, secured if you use HTTPS. So in the next example, we will see the random numbers generation. So in this side, the random API is used. And in this side, the secure random API is used. As you can guess seeing this secure prefix that this one is secure and this one is insecure. So the random number generated using this random API actually takes a definite mathematical algorithm, so which makes it predictable. For the secure random, uh, this actually uh, uh, creates the random uh, number which is uh, unpredictable and non-deterministic. Okay, so let's see the uh, next example. So the message digest API, it actually takes uh, an algorithm, a hash algorithm. So in this case, in this uh, code snippet, it takes MD5, and in this code snippet, it takes Charter 56. So which algorithm uses is secure and which is insecure? So I think you have already guessed uh, that MD5 is insecure because MD5 is now um, vulnerable as it has the collision, it is vulnerable to collision attacks. And for this, uh, SHA-256 is actually a strong, secure uh, hash algorithm. Okay, so next, let's see uh, the ciphers for encryption and uh, decryption. This actually created using DS algorithm, ECB, uh, um, ECB and this is actually uh, takes the AES and CBC. So, uh, what is uh, so? Which one is secure and which one is insecure? So we can see that uh, DES uh, is actually insecure because DES is actually uh, broken. is considered broken as um, as adversaries. Uh, they can uh, do brute force attack for 64 um, bit ciphers. And ECB uh, is actually, uh, it, can, uh, it can actually uh, show what is inside the plain text in an uh, uh, in a, a abstract way. And for the AES, it's actually extend the, uh, the this is actually extended version of uh, um, has extended key value and extended um, block size. So this is more secure than DES. And the cipher block uh, chaining, this is uh, more secure than e, uh, uh, ECB. This is the generation for the cryptographic keys. Secret key aspect do is that it actually generates a secret key using a byte array. So this key byte and this key byte, they actually generate in a different way in this two core snippet. So 
which one do you think is secure and which one is insecure? So we see that in this case, the SecDiv uh, 2020, this is a constant string and this string is used to produce these key bytes. So this is a constant value and any attacker can um, intercept this uh, string can guess what the secret key is and then uh, the purpose of encryption will be uh, will be invalid and for secure case we can see that uh, random unpredictable and non-deterministic um, key bytes is always getting generated so in this case uh, this is more secure as attackers uh, cannot guess what the key bytes would be. So these are the simple examples we have now shown. And uh, after after this, uh, Yao will present some more secure versus insecure examples. Hello, the next part, uh, I will introduce some JSSE code examples for the TLS and SSL authentication. Many studies have pointed out that TLS and SSL are pretty important. Um, misconfiguration of it can cause the man in the middle attacks. Here is a piece of code to build a HTTPS connection protected by the TLS. At the line three, when we get the input string, all the TLS authentication happens implicitly uh, like that. And if the, uh, any exception occurs uh, and throw out, the connection will be terminated. However, not all the exceptions uh, occurs because of the attackers. Uh, sometimes even the legitimate users uh, could also raise the exceptions due to the configuration issues. And uh, to fix this kind of exceptions, uh, we need to securely customize, uh, customize the trust manager and the hosting verifier. Trust manager and hosting verifier are two JSSE interfaces uh, taking control of the authentication process. And that working logic is shown here. The trust manager is responsible to verify whether the certificate is uh, legitimate. And then the hosting verifier is responsible to verify whether the hosting appearing in the URL matches to the, the names appearing in the certificate. And uh, therefore, we, we need to customize them carefully and to avoid any, uh, to avoid any, uh, uh, security vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, next, we will we'll work through several examples. Next, we will uh, work through several examples of the customized trust managers to see whether they are secure or not. Uh, this is the example one. This is a class implementing the trust manager. And uh, um, there are two methods at line three and uh, line eight. They are uh, they define the verification logic for the certificate we ex uh, we received. So whether this is a secure example, we can see here it is not secure uh, because actually no verification happens here, and the empty method body just means doing nothing, and any certificate could uh, by Pass this uh, could pass this process, and uh, this is uh, uh, the second example. Uh, you may notice that at line eight, uh, there uh, the verification behavior happens. However, whether this is a secure example, uh, the answer is still no, because actually uh, we expect the unlegitimate certificate could raise exceptions to terminate the uh, communication. However, at line 10, uh, all the exceptions are captured. And in this way, um, no, you, uh, in this way, any exceptions is, uh, is, is caught without handling. So any certificate could pass the verification. 
And this is uh, another example, which is more complicated. At line 10, uh, the verification behavior happens and without catching the exception. So uh, do you think it is a secure example? And the answer is still no, because it only performs the verification under some conditions. And when the certificate chain, uh, the length equals to one, that indicates that we only receive a single certificate rather than uh, a chain uh, with the intermediate certificate attached. Uh, uh, in this case, it will only did the check validity rather than the verification behavior. And the method check validity, it only checks whether this certificate uh, is expired and it cannot tell about whether it is a legitimate one. So in that case, the attacker is easy to bypass the authentication by only sending a single certificate without a uh, complete chain. Uh, and next, we will show you several secure ways to customize the trust manager. And the full examples uh, is shown in this GitHub. We only display some key parts here. First, we describe a scenario that is maybe you are developing a client and this client want to uh, visit the, uh, an internal server uh, which only has a self-signed certificate. Uh, another situation could be like uh, your code is under the development mode and the server has not got the official certificate yet. Uh, so the secure way to do it is through the key store and the key store is a Java entity to store all the certificate we trust, uh, including the intermediate CA certificate. And uh, uh, the recommended practice is that if you want to trust this certificate, you just put it in the key store and the trust manager relies on the key store to make this decisions. Here is the code doing so and we do not expect you to memorize every line of the code, just get to know the concept and the take home message is that always configure your key store rather than disabling the verification logic. Here we can see that the special trust .crt is the file of the certificate and it is loaded into a trust manager we created here and this trust manager is uh, is, is fit into a, a this key store is fit into a trust manager and using this trust manager we can let the certificate we trust to pass the verification. And then we describe another scenario, like your clients want to both visit the internal server and also some external ser servers as normal. And in that case, you may need two key stores. And the one is the key store you specified. And the second is a default key store locating in uh, that directory in your system. And uh, you, you may need two trust managers to trust them separately. Uh, another choice could be you, you could mix these certificates into one key stores, but it is not recommended because uh, for the management purpose, because sometimes people want to manage some uh, a key store separately for the system and also maybe different key stores for different applications. So next we show you how to use two key stores together. And this is a customized uh, trust manager. It actually includes two separate trust managers. One is called, uh, called default TM and the, uh, the other called backup TM. And the default TM, we just use the system key store. And the backup T TM, we just relays on the specified key store as we introduced in the example one. So this time we need to uh, override this method, this 
check server trusted, which specifies the verification logic. And here at line 11, we first use the default trust manager to verify the certificate. And if any exception occurs, we will call the backup TM to see whether it can be handled by this trust manager. Uh, another situation is similar, just like if you have more than two key stores. And the example is like that, you just need uh, the trust manager and it includes a list of uh, trust managers and each one may be released on different key stores. And the verification logic is like at 10, uh, at the line 10, you uh, use them in order. And if the certificate is trusted uh, by any of the trust manager, it, uh, this process is returned normally. And if not, None of them could recognize this certificate. It will raise an uh, exception to terminate the connection. And next, we move on the hostname verifier part. The hostname verifier is responsible to match the hostname to the, the name appearing in the certificate. But sometimes due to many reasons, maybe the virtual hosting, like uh, the certificate may have lots of names, a common name and some alternative name, or maybe a server has multiple certificates. So maybe it returns uh, a wrong name like that. So in that case, we need to vary, uh, we need to customize the host name verifier. And this is an example. Let's to see whether it is a secure example. And uh, we can e easily figure out that it is not secure because no matter the host name is, it will return true. Always let it pass the verification. And this is uh, another example. We can see at line 12, uh, the URL, uh, actually the host name appearing in the URL ends with .org. However, the name we expect um, in the certificate ends with .com. So to, uh, to fix this issue, to handle it, uh, it uses a customized hostname verifier and to specify the expected hostname here. So this is actually an, this is actually a secure example. Uh, and this hostname verifier only uses for this connection. And uh, finally, we, uh, we talk about another vulnerability type happening when we using the SSL socket factory. Uh, previously, we showed the code snippets to build uh, an HTTPS connection. However, the TLS could also support other protocols. So sometimes we need to use some low level uh, APIs like, like the SSL socket factory to build the connection. And and uh, an issue we need to notice is that when we build the connection with the SSL socket factory, the implicit authentication only includes the first step we introduced, which is handled by the trust manager. And the second step, which is handled by the hostname verifier is missing. So we have to manually do that to guarantee the security. And next I will show you some, some examples to make it more clear. Uh, th this is the example one. Uh, the, that is a uh, socket, and this socket is built from the SSL socket factory. And when we use these sockets, all the implicit uh, authentication, or we should say that incomplete authentication happens. And uh, uh, this is an insecure example because the authentication only includes the trust manager without the hostname verification. So uh, this is an example, like how can we secure this connection? And the, from the line five, uh, we need to insert an extra part to manually obtain a hostname verifier and manually do the verification. If the return value is false, we need to uh, throw an, uh, an exception for it. And this is another example uh, also could use to 
the cue, the connection, and doing it in another way that is setting an SSL parameters at HTTPS. In this way, uh, the automatic hostname verification uh, happens just like the HTTPS connection. So next part, we have set up to introduce uh, a crypto guard, uh, which is a detection tool. Okay. So now I'll actually talk about the design philosophies and uh, technical details of CryptoGuard. So CryptoGuard is a static analysis tool, which is built on top of Suits data flow analysis engine. And it takes source codes and APKs as inputs and does some pre-processing. And after that, it uh, uh, runs various rules to check cryptographic misuses. And for those rules, what it does is it uses a different version of different slicing algorithm, forward and backward data flow, uh, the, the slicing algorithms based on forward and backward data flow analysis. And the specialty of these algorithms are they are uh, specially customized by leveraging the insights from uh, different programming idioms and language restrictions. And after that, after uh, finishing the analysis, it actually produces the report. So act precise detection of cryptographic misuse is actually a hard problem. And uh, uh, CryptoLint is one of the initial efforts that actually explored this problem. And since then, this problem got lots of attention from both industry and the academia. And Cryacel is the uh, uh, state of the art solution. But however, to be practical, we need, uh, we need to be, uh, uh, have little, uh, uh, as, as uh, little or uh, as the false positives and false negatives need to be as low as possible. So most of the state of the art tools are tends to either producing more false positive or more false negative. And CryptoGuard is the first solution to reach uh, this uh, practical criteria. So next I'll talk about the different challenges that we faced during building this static analysis tool. So like any other static analysis tool, the main challenge we face is the trade-off among false positive, false negatives and scalability. So to avoid high scalability, we actually uh, avoid uh, expensive path sensitive analysis. So the next question is how do we actually handle false positives? So in this slide, I will try to give you some uh, idea about how we reduce false positive or what are the insight uh, behind. So first, let's assume that we want to find hard-coded keys from this code snippet. And uh, now if we run backward data flow analysis from uh, the uh, program point, new secret key spec, then we can find that uh, default key is, is actually a hard-coded key. So now if we assume that uh, the uh, method bodies of some orthogonal invocations are missing during the analysis, like uh, the key.getBytes or context.getProperty, then what will happen is this analysis will also report some other uh, uh, constants, hard-coded constants like pass.key pass .key and UTF-8. And you can see that this doesn't actually impact the secrecy of the key. Thus, these are considered false positives. And other uh, uh, constants like uh, data structure, bookkeeping variables can also contribute to the problem. So to reduce false positive, we use the insights from uh, the uh, Java programming uh, language and also the uh, idioms uh, of common uh, of common programming idioms. So, for example, 
let's uh, assume that the implementation for this method get bytes is not available during analysis so in this line the virtual invoke is used to invoke the virtual methods on the object key and here utf8 is used uh, access that uh, uh, in, in uh, utf8 is actually indicating the uh, state of the key material that we want to access so if we can actually see that this type of state indicator variables doesn't actually impact the secrecy of the key so we can uh, uh, ignore uh, these arguments of different uh, uh, virtual invoke uh, functions the same thing is true for various resource identifiers so in this statement we are using pass dot key to access the uh, or to rest uh, restore or identify a resource from uh, a key store or uh, uh, from a map or that uh, of any uh, data structure or any resources that uh, uh, lies in the memory so again here pass dot key doesn't actually affect the secrecy of the key and we can actually note that the same thing happens for other resource identifiers too so based on these observations we created uh, five heuristics or refinement insights to customize our data flow analysis algorithm and we evaluated our uh, crypto guard on around 46 real world apache projects and more than 6000 android apps and our analysis shows that it actually helps us to reduce around 76% uh, uh, false alerts in uh, apache and around 80% of the alerts in android so this So th this is the result of our manual analysis of Apache alerts. So we observed that around uh, uh, more than uh, 1200 alert, uh, 12, uh, 1295 alerts and our manual analysis confirms that there are only 18 false positives which indicates the uh, rate of 1.39%. So another challenge is to, so now we have uh, scalable algorithms, uh, data flow analysis algorithms, and we know how to reduce false positives uh, to improve the performance. But for the scalability, these are not enough. Uh, for example, we, uh, the uh, code we analyzed from Apache, one of the projects Apache Hadoop has uh, more than 2 million lines of code and the average lines of code were 4.2k so for to, an, to analyze or to have scalability of uh, to, for analyzing these kind of projects we have, we need more uh, 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 design insights of how can we reduce uh, 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 the runtime overhead so the main insight behind uh, to, to overcome this challenge and optimize the performance is there are in large scale projects, uh, large code bases, the codes are organized in modularized sub projects so that uh, different modules or different sub projects can be reused by other software components. So here is a uh, uh, sub project dependency graph of uh, uh, Apache Ranger and uh, we can uh, so our analysis during our analysis we can see that the only Apache Ranger plugins commons have some cryptographic API uses and uh, uh, security admin sub project and plugins key sub project of the one uh, plugins KMS are the sub project that relies uh, uh, these are the sub project that rely on this uh, ranger plugin commons so that means only these sub project have 
some potential to have cryptographic misuse means none of the other projects have any cryptographic api use or they depend on any other sub project that has uh, any sort of cryptographic api misuse so this means that all the other sub we can actually ignore all the other sub projects like uh, uh, ranger util ranger plugins uh, audit or the famous things like that and also the root sub project we call one sub project as, as root sub project if uh, if the, uh, no sub projects are dependent on this one and the, the independent or uh, root sub project can be also analyzed in parallel So uh, CryptoGuard doesn't only use backward data flow analysis and for some of the other rules, it also uses uh, forward data flow analysis. And one of the uh, rule is to find insecure uses of SSL sockets that uh, ER demonstrated. And for some other rules, we actually need multiple analysis. So for example, to detect the insecure uses of RSA key, first we have to identify whether an RSA algorithm is being used. And we also have to identify whether the key pair generator of the RSA key pair algorithm is initialized and initialized to uh, uh, find out whether the key pair in uh, uh, generator is initialized with the right key, we have to run, run another uh, round of analysis that is backward data flow analysis or backward slicing. So, the, uh, so to detect one cryptographic misuse, the use of multiple round of analysis is only possible because of the scalability of our algorithm or the lightweightness. And uh, our analysis actually discovered lots of uh, cryptographic misuses in top tier Apache projects, including Apache Spark, Apache Opbiz, Apache Ranger. And uh, these projects are being used by millions of users business across the world. So here, is a code snippet in Apache and I want to highlight the uh, insecure portions of, uh, from these code snippets. And it, it has at least three uh, and that's why I call it a zoo of cryptographic misuse. So first code is used to uh, initialize the First, this code is used to initialize the uh, password-based encryption, uh, the key for password-based encryption. So the first problem is the first problem is it generates password, it, uh, it generates sort from the password itself. So here you can see that when the password is as an R and it's creating, it's, it's copying uh, the size of the salt into the salt uh, variable. And that salt is being used as the salt for uh, uh, TV based password based entry. So then it's uh, uh, nullifying the use of salt on the first place. So the uh, main reason the, uh, why we use is the unpredictability of the salt makes it uh, 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 indistinguishable even if two passwords are identical but if we have uh, deterministic salts uh, security guarantee is gone and we can also see that this uh, weak MD5 uh, hashing, well, then those solve uh, or solve by. So, 
since md5 is broken someone can actually so this salt has the potential to give up the password itself and also the number of iteration is used as the length of the password and that means if the password is not of 1000 characters then this uh, the length parameter is also insecure And for Android apps, our, our analysis uh, actually is new security insights. So we see that around 96% of the issues comes from main libraries. And most of the time, they are not even in the main application. So next, uh, I'll hand over to Shaming. Shaming will talk about uh, some of the uh, the talk about the APIs that we designed to detect different sort of uh, uh, to uh, evaluate the performance of different cryptographic misuse detection tools. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, crypto API bench benchmark. Okay, so we built a crypto API bench benchmark, which is based on Java cryptographic big API misuses. So mainly it contains about 171 unit test cases with uh, 16 different cryptographic rules. So there were uh, three major motivations uh, for uh, developing this crypto API bench. The first one was we want to uh, improve the, uh, we want um, the tools to get better performance by improving their tools using uh, uh, the benchmark. Uh, and then uh, we can compare different uh, existing tools and find out their relative performance, their coverage, and let developers uh, know that which tools is suitable for them to use. And um, the third motivation was we want to educate the uh, novice uh, developers who want to know about the uh, cryptographic vulnerabilities as the uh, cryptographic apps, the benchmark uh, contains the secure codes and insecure codes. So our uh, benchmark is uh, actually open sourced and here is the GitLab, and Git, uh, there is the GitHub link here. So uh, there is inside there, there's uh, 16 folders uh, representing the 16 rules and you can um, see the 171 unit test cases inside these folders. And also, there is an Excel file inside the GitHub where uh, the which files contains which vulnerability in which method and which lines. These are uh, there are detailed information about um, the file exists in the bench in the uh, benchmark. So here is the um, crypto API bench structure. We have uh, 40 basic cases and 131 advanced cases. The basic ones is uh, very straightforward and it has like a uh, very small case, just one procedure. And the source of uh, vulnerability exists within the, um, like originate within the same procedure. And in the advanced cases, they have, in, we have uh, interprocedural, field sensitive, combined cases, path sensitive cases, multiple class and some miscellaneous uh, map interface cases. Uh, we will see just a couple of uh, examples on these advanced cases. So here is the, here is an example of interprocedural case. So what happens here in this case is that you can see this line, the PB parameters X is actually, um, this actually have a specified a set of parameters, uh, salt and iteration count. It uh, defines these six parameters for password-based encryption. And to be secure, this iteration count value should be greater than 1,000. And if the count value is less than 1,000, then it's considered insecure. So let's track that where's the value of uh, where's the value of this count, the iteration count value. So if you see the main uh, method, the iter this count value is 20, and then it's actually passing to this 
another procedure and use this count value here. So what's the purpose of having this uh, unique case case? So this case actually checks the tool's ability to find out like whether it can identify the count value coming from a different procedure. Uh, next, we have the path sensitive uh, advanced case example. So this is the, uh, and this is also the password based encryption example, but here, instead of having like different procedures, we have the conditional statement here. So we can see that first the situation count value was five, which is insecure. Now, based on this choice value, the count can be uh, five, which is insecure, or the count can be changed to 1050, which will become secure. So this unit test case, it um, identifies whether a tool can determine um, the count value from conditional statement. Okay. So now, uh, when we have the Crip API bench, we were grateful that there is, uh, there are several uh, um, vulnerability, cryptographic vulnerability detection tools. We um, uh, evaluate the spot bugs, CryptoGuard, Cryosil, and Coverity uh, for the comparison. As I have already said that in Crypto API events, there were 16 rules, but we found that uh, among them, six common rules uh, was covered by four of these tools. So be fair, we compare these tools only based on these six common rules. So this is the evaluation results for the basic cases and the second table is evaluation result for the advanced cases. So if you see the basic case result, you see that the spot bugs, crypto guard and covered if they have a similar uh, result and gives a better performance than Chrysler because Chrysler have more uh, false positive and false negative values than the other tools. And for the advanced cases, we uh, see that the spot bugs, uh, the recall and precision value is zero. It's because that uh, spot bugs is not designed to capture any advanced cases. We find another um, interesting uh, point that none of these tools actually handle the path sensitive cases. Uh, and another uh, thing I have to mention that this result is uh, based on uh, like uh, around March 2019, uh, real, uh, 19, around that time's result because we reported this uh, in our uh, crypto API event sector paper. But since then, uh, an amazing thing is that Crasso uh, is evolving and they are actually getting uh, uh, evolving and they incorporate uh, crypto API events as their test suit and they are getting uh, uh, improved results. So, um, and if you, uh, if you want to know more about uh, the crypto API bench or the insecure secure cases or the, uh, or the tools um, um, coverage or performance, you can welcome to see uh, the paper and also the GitHub page. So in the next, um, yeah, we'll show the perfect results. Uh, next, I will briefly introduce um, my experience about how to uh, reuse the insights of Crypto Guard in other detection, uh, in other vulnerability detection tools to uh, achieve the high precision. And first, I want to introduce uh, another tool called Parfait. And Oracle Parfait, it is uh, a scalable bug scanner, um, which is developed and maintained by Oracle Labs. And uh, uh, it covers various 
types of vulnerabilities, for example, uh, like the defects from the CWE top 25 vulnerability list. And uh, currently, uh, Parfait also covers a module called Parfait Crypto Scanner, which integrates the pre precise and scalable uh, crypto graphic API misuse detection. Uh, and this work is done by me uh, as I was an uh, internship uh, working in the Oracle Labs Australia. And these are uh, the um, collaborators. And uh, we currently, uh, we have a paper in the archive and welcome to check that. And uh, uh, Parfait actually has some special designs to promote the scalability. And uh, uh, in order to reuse the refinement program slicing insights and heuristics from the CryptoGuard, we have to tailor the CryptoGuard algorithm under the, uh, the, the support and the frameworks of Parfait. Uh, here I just introduce a major difference. Uh, like this is a layered framework uh, of Parfait. Uh, Parfait uh, actually, it's, um, it, it's optimized all the analysis in order from quickest to slowest to guarantee the scalability. And in this way, like the more vulnerabilities can be reported with, uh, with a lower time overhead. And uh, specifically, for example, to perform our backward interprocedure program slicing and the analysis it starts from the slicing criterion in method A and after reaching the entry point of method A we need to like jump to its color method D and if the analysis has not been terminated we need to even jump to its color's color method F. However in Parfait's framework all of these themes are uh, broken down into different layers Layers, like the, the, the method A, the analysis happens in method A and the other analysis are all scheduled in layer one. And if the analysis has not uh, terminated, we just perform other analysis in the same layer. And after that, we go into the next layer two for its color. In this way, like uh, all the vulnerability uh, requiring uh, the lowest time overhead could be reported uh, quickly. And uh, uh, we also test our um, Parfait-based crypto scanner in uh, the crypto API bench to test its precision. And we can find that uh, it has a really excellent record and very few uh, false negatives here. And for the, um, for the precision, uh, uh, all the first positives come from the past sensitivity cases. So uh, the, the precision excluding the past sensitivity cases for, for other cases are all very good. And we, another important issue for the, another important feature for uh, our Parfait is the scalability because we expect it, 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 it to uh, to be run uh, for some large code bases. So we tested uh, many internal uh, large code bases of Oracle and uh, the, the, the precision is verified manually. And we also found that the precision is really high. And we also record the the runtime performance of these code bases and the, the line of uh, line of code. Uh, we found that most of the projects can be finished uh, within 10 minutes. And uh, also even with some of them has millions of code, it, the, the runtime is still pretty good and less than 10 minutes. And next uh, we will have uh, Myers to introduce uh, some demo about how to use our CryptoGuard. And next I'll present how to use CryptoGuard using a live demo. So for the setup that I'll be using, I'll be using two different major technologies. The first one called Binder. And you can think of Binder as a service that creates a virtual environment for you. 
and I'll also be using a Jupyter Notebook. And you, you can also think about that as a live web browser based IDE. And for our specific setup, we need to use the iJava Jupyter Notebook. And for this demo, uh, you can follow along at any time after this video. Uh, once you open the specific website, uh, my binder or binder will actually retrieve all of the information from GitHub and create its own virtual environment. And from that, the virtual environment will automatically start the Jupyter Notebook so you can easily walk through and go through each step of the notebook itself. So as you can see here, I have the video of the demo. And again, feel free to follow along or go back to the actual notebook itself at this hyperlink. And to start off with, um, I've already pre-ran all of the cells since, or all of the code logic since the tests do take some time. And of course, at the top of every program, especially with the Jupyter Notebooks, you need to import all the necessary libraries and dependencies. And especially, specifically for this case, uh, for this command, this allows us to load a CryptoGuard jar and that's hosted within the same environment of the virtual environment itself. And as you can see, there's still a lot of imported dependencies for this demo. And currently, uh, this cell shows us what version of CryptoGuard we're demoing. And currently, we're looking at version 04.05.01. If we go a little further, since CryptoGuard requires Java version 8, and this notebook requires a different version of Java, this cell allows us to pass the correct path of Java 8 to CryptoGuard and allow us to continue through with this demo. And if we go to the next cell, all of these methods and all of these paths are created and set up to help support all of the test methods. And as you can see, it, we have a short method to show approximately how long each test took. And for the first test section, we have Android APKs. And again, this cell, which is all Java code, it sets up the path to the files that are to be written out and the source. So if we look here, this first test is directly taken out of the live CryptoGuard test suite and directly put into here. And to go more specifically into the direct usage of CryptoGuard, we have a string that controls all of the arguments passed in. And throughout this test and these similar test cases, all of these are passed in exactly how they would be used from the command line. And I'll quickly go over each argument really quick. So the first argument specifies that we're looking at an Android APK. The second argument specifies the specific path to the APK. Third argument specifies the format that we'll be printing or writing out the contents. And in this case, we'll be using legacy format. The next two arguments specify the paths to the Android SDK and the Java 8 environment as well. And I'll skip over the next argument since this argument is, should only be used for testing purposes. And the last argument is specifying the file that CryptoGuard will actually write the results out to. If we go a little bit further, you can see all of these arguments right before they're entered into CryptoGuard how they actually look. 
And this can be used as a frame of reference to use CryptoGuard directly on the command line. So since this scan is already completed, let me skip ahead to the results. And there we go. As we can see, CryptoGuard su successfully scanned the appdebug.apk. And as stated earlier, MD5 is likely an insecure hash that was successfully picked up by CryptoGuard in the following package. And if we scroll down further, we can see more of the rules broken, such as constant code or uh, untrusted PRNG. And if we go, oh, and the test took approximately 35 seconds. So if we go to the next test, still scanning the same source file, we instead change the file out of the format to use a specific XML format. And this was previously requested for CryptoGuard. And throughout the redesign of CryptoGuard, we're able to successfully print out the same results to the XML format. And this is the same contents of the scan above since it's scanning the same APK file. And if we go to the next test, you'll see we're not specifying any uh, format out as we set JSON as the default format out. And if we scroll to the bottom, you can see all of similar attributes are set into the JSON output. And if we quickly go to, I believe this last APK test, we're specifying to use a CSV type format out, which like the previous tests before, writes out the examples in the specific usable CSV format. And next we'll go, we'll lightly go over how CryptoGuard can scan Java class files. And like the APK test set above it, this cell sets up all the necessary paths for scanning Java class files. And to note specifically in this test, we're allowed to put an invalid path for the Android APK since that isn't used in scanning Java class files. And below that, we have two specific arguments, notably string and pretty. Uh, pretty formats the output that's printed out or written out by CryptoGuard. And we'll see it down below in the results. And stream, most notably, allows CryptoGuard to write out the test results to the file instead of gathering all of the results and writing all of the file at the end of the execution. And this helps alleviate any kind of memory strain on the JVM. And so if we quickly go check the results, we'll see that mm, the output is still in XML format, but it's properly formatted this time and more human readable than the previous output. And last but not least, for Java classes, we'll also look into how CryptoGuard can also write out the input to a YAML type format. Quickly scroll to test results. Mm. All of the results are printed out in a YAML based format for even more usability if CryptoGuard is used as a dependency or a library. Now, following that, we'll go over 
a crypto guard can scan a jar file. And like with the tests above, this test setup is similar. And instead we pass in the Java jar file and the only extra argument passed in is a time measure Boolean, which allows CryptoGuard to quickly print out approximately how long the test and the scan took from its side. And while I'm still waiting to scroll down, previously in all the tests we check if the operating system is a Linux type, and that's solely due to the fact that CryptoGuard can only be used, currently only be used on a Linux system. And as you can tell from the printout, it's commented to allow the file out to still be a valid XML format. And it took approximately eight seconds from CryptoGuard's side. And to allow CryptoGuard to be used in more cases than on the command line as showed here, we also started hooking CryptoGuard into Java build tools. And these plugins for the build tools only help to pass the information from the project to CryptoGuard, as it only retrieves relevant information such as the source code and dependencies and passes that to CryptoGuard to scan all of the files. And then after this happens, all the information is returned in a proper file format to the user. And since this is a Java-based language and project, we're aiming to look into Maven and Gradle for the top two build tools we use. And of course, the plugins are aptly named Maven Guard for Maven and Gradle Guard for Gradle. And since these tools are still under active development, they each currently only support three different tasks. And these tasks are version, which prints the current version of CryptoGuard in the plugin, preview files, which allows the user to see which files are picked up from the plugin to allow CryptoGuard to scan, and scan files, which of course, sends all the files and information to CryptoGuard to scan. And like I said, all three, CryptoGuard and each plugin are still under active development. We would welcome any pull requests or any insights into each of the projects, as can be shown from these links here. So I would like to now pass it off to Dr. Sazdar Rahman so he can dive more into spring security misconfiguration issues. So I want to emphasize more on one point. So we have multiple types of our input output formats for CryptoGuard. So this is uh, basically done so that CryptoGuard can be easily integrated with any sort of uh, platform or uh, uh, static analysis platform that you have in your development environment or even in production environment. So if you think you can leverage our tool uh, uh, to help secure code in your uh, organization or personally, then uh, uh, feel free to reach us out. So next, what I am gonna talk about is uh, uh, application framework configuration misuses. So, not only libraries are being misused, but also the application frameworks are also, uh, the configuration especially for different application frameworks are also being heavily misused by the community. And uh, there is a talk coming up in the main conference that will be presented by Mazharud. So I'll not spoil his talk in this tutorial, just I will give you a teaser like what sort of uh, uh, security anti-patterns we found during our uh, exploration. So one thing uh, in his talk, he will actually talk about how different lifelong valid access tokens can affect security of the uh, Spring applications. 
and how developers manually disable protections that are provided by default in Spring Security and some, any, some, some other security anti-patterns. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach us out. And finally, thank you for watching this. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the uh, wonderful tutorial, different components. I just want to quickly add um, a couple of things. Uh, for us, the Java 8, it's a, the limitation right now is because of suit uh, does not support Java 9 and above. And so, again, community contribution. Um, and uh, uh, Parfait does not uh, uh, use a crypto guard uh, um, directly because they have their own uh, framework, as Ya explained. And, and then some of their analysis is to build on top of uh, uh, LVM, I believe, and so, um, uh, so that explains. Um, uh, yeah, I need to do a lot of uh, did a lot of work during her internship um, to fit a uh, uh, crypto guard detection in her thing. Um, anything else to add before we end the recording? All right, um, and so uh, bye, everyone. <laughs>